Hey there, this is Rena Saboli Lane and welcome to another conversation on creating your perfect work. If you follow me, then you know it is my absolute life's mission to equip you to discover design and get highly paid to do work you love. Whether that means radically changing careers, launching a business, or bringing your big idea to life. And so today is a pretty special conversation and we're going to be talking about something that most women don't like to talk about. And it's what we call the desert years. And this beautiful woman who is sharing the screen with me is Livia Chang, and she's going to help us navigate through the desert years. And so I, before I reveal why Livia is so awesome, um, let me talk about why we're actually having this conversation now. So you see, sometimes we have these experiences, right, in life, um, and they can fundamentally change who we are. Like they can be profound experiences like losing, like the death of a mom or a spouse or a child. They can be personal or professional failures. Um, they can be rejections or, or childhood traumas. And they can be more benign, like, like stepping out of the workplace to have kids and now trying to navigate yourself back into the workplace. So, I mean, they can, it can cross the spectrum in terms of how, how profound those experiences are, but whatever they are, um, when we talk about desert years, they can rock our confidence. They can alter our sense of, of stability, mentally, emotionally, or otherwise. They can change, you know, how we view what's possible, you know, as it relates to creating those, you know, the, that perfect work. And, and so those moments, as Livia describes them, are the desert years. And so what's crazy about desert years is that if you're not present, you might not even know um, how much you're being impacted by what you're going through. Like life can throw so many distractions of, of work and kids and family and, you know, commitments and all of that. And it's not until we view that situation from the rearview mirror. And sometimes it's like two years later or whatever that we realize what we really went through and how it may have delayed, blocked, or impacted our ability to create our perfect work. And so um, I'm excited to have Olivia here. Um, and I want to I want to talk a little bit about who she is, and I want to talk about why 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 she's here and how awesome. But let me tell you a little bit about the profession side. So Olivia is the West Coast Executive Director for Ascend Pan Asian Leadership, and she's responsible for the Western Territories and several key national anti-bias initiatives for Ascend. So Ascend is a not-for-profit that's focused on promoting pan-Asian executives in corporate uh, North America. And her passion lies in supporting um, the community vision and the mission to move corporate and organizational practices forward to be so much more inclusive um, and to have a, an inclusive working and leadership culture. So prior to Ascend, Livia was a bad, bad woman as well. She was a senior associate at, at Ernst & Young and she helped build their business um, across the Pacific Northwest, and she's had lots of clients, you know, that were Fortune 500 global companies and the like. Um, but here's the skinny, and here's why you're going to love Livia, and I'm excited about Livia. Where did we meet? We met at a Women in Tech event, right? I think yeah. that was it. So yeah. Livia and I were both panelists um, for a Women in Tech, you know, something we were talking about, and I was like, why y'all want me talking about tech? <laughs> I have an engineering background, but I, I know. I'm, 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 and I've a, yeah, right. Yeah. So we, so, so we were speaking at this little women in tech event and it was awesome. Um, but I remember just being enamored by her authenticity, um, her realness, um, and, and life just has a way of, of pulling you together in ways that you just never expect. And so when I pulled together this series, I specifically wanted to have an organization that represented Asian, you know, American professionals. And so when I started looking and searching through Ascend, I looked through their leadership team and there she was. And I remembered Olivia because I loved her name so much that it was on the short list of what I was going to name my daughter. And so that's, that's how that, so, so it was a beautiful kind of reunion. And, and so I wanted her here really for her authenticity, but there are three things that we're going to nail in this conversation for you. And then we're going to kind of dive on in. First, we're going to address how do you know um, when you're in the midst of the desert years? Like, how do you know if you're just having a bad week, bad month, bad year? Um, because we get good at masking things. And so we're going to really talk about, you know, what are some of the signs? What are some of the symptoms? And, and, and how do you make some decisions around that? We're going to talk about what you do during your desert years. 
Um, how do you cope in, in more productive ways? Because here's the deal, desert year doesn't mean that you're out there destitute, homeless, on the street someplace. <laughs> desert mm -hmm. year could just mean you're going through some things um, mm -hmm. and you're trying your best to function through life and, and to show up and be fabulous and all of that, but you know that there's some refinement that's being happened. And the last piece is, what are the gins in the desert years? Mm -hmm. Like, why do each and every one of us have to go through those? And how does that impact how we show up and how we can create work that we love? And so with all of that, I just want to welcome you, Livia. Thank you for taking the time. Um, I'm so delighted that you're here. And I know that so many people are going to be blessed um, by your story and your insights. So welcome. Thank you, Vanessa. And back at you and all the beautiful things that you said about me. I mean, I think sisterhood is such an important thing. Um, you know, as we, as we grow, yep. and especially as leaders, um, you know, in whatever work environment that, that we are. Yep. And so it's, it's been just as important, if not more so to reconnect with you as well. Yay. So here we go. So obviously this conversation, um, this entire series is around creating your perfect work and perfect work is not to be confused with perfection, right? Our perfect work really is that career business that we know that we're meant to do. It's the cause we're meant to champion. It's the people we're meant to support. It's the contribution that we believe that we're meant to make in the world. It, with all of its risk, its challenges, its frustrations, all of that. And so as we start to embark on this conversation around desert years, Livia, why do you believe it, today's topic is critical to a woman's ability to create her perfect work, to create work that she loves, to get highly paid doing it? Why is this topic so important? So I'm Gen X and um, I feel like the last maybe five, 10 years of my work experience, I've, I've seen a lot of um, the last two generations, let's just say Gen Z, you know, millennials uh, and kudos to parents. I mean, it comes comes to also my background. I'm Chinese American, I'm born in New York, but um, almost I will I won't say I'm a native Californian, but I've been here 40 years. And yes, yeah, I know I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I know I look good. No, why are you talking about New York? <laughs> um, but what I was going to say is uh, I've noticed that a lot of parents and I, and I think it's great um, that for their children, um, they've, they've got almost everything laid out, all really planned, right? Almost to a T, you know, in terms of activities, starting from almost when they're born. Mm -hmm. And that's what actually made the millennials, the millennials, right? Mm -hmm. But I came from an era where I was born in the 70s mm -hmm. and um, grew up in the 80s. And we, we were latchkey kids. A yes, lot of, that's right. right. Yeah. And so, five. I, right? Five. And, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I come from that generation where absolutely I felt the love of my parents and their care. And, um, but I also didn't have a lot that was you know, they were immigrants, right? My mom was born in Southern China, grew up in Taiwan. My father was born in, in Middle China in Hubei and grew up in Hong Kong. And they met in Taiwan, immigrated here, got married at the United Nations building in New York. So I'm, I'm a United Nations baby, I guess you could say, because mm -hmm. I, I was conceived, I think, not long after that. <laughs> um, but why I think it's important to you know address this topic is because I, by dint of life, uh, I didn't really get a choice, but there was some, I guess you know freedom to say, okay, there needs to be some time you take for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking about the generations that came after me, um, I sometimes feel like I'm amazed. Number one, I'm so amazed at you know the, the generations before me and the generations after me where I do see a lot of folks and I'm in and also career development so I see a lot of college age students just literally like they have a pamphlet on what to do right and they do not veer away from that for me it's really important that you know 
you understand your voice and you have time and you give yourself time to explore what you like and what you don't like. Now, is it your, now has, you know, the pamphlet been planned for you before you even knew, which is fine, you know, but sometimes life is going to throw you a few curveballs. What happens when, when your life veers or decisions or things out of your control yeah. are going to knock you off your plan? Right. And so I think, it's really important for people to know, and I'm here living proof to say that it's okay to veer from your path and be lost a little yeah. bit. And in fact, maybe whether you're lost years, for me, it was probably a good two years, you know, during uh, my career where I gave myself permission to do that is that I found myself yeah. and I, and now I'm sitting here today to really be able to share that you know, probably that veering away and being able to and feeling like knowing that maybe it was okay to be, you know, on a path where I didn't know where I was going to go. Yeah. There were like not a lot of goals. And I, and, and I was, I was, and we'll get into it. I was suffering from a lot of grief is that I just gave myself permission to be a little bit lost. And I found um, a really rewarding journey to myself, back to my Core. And now I feel like sitting here today talking to you, I am a whole person mm -hmm. and I'm okay to even have more lost years later on because I'm comfortable. I wasn't comfortable when it happened, but I'm comfortable with the, with the gems, as you say, that came out of exploring. I love that. I love it. And it's, and I think it's, it tees up well, because as, as people are listening, you're probably thinking like, what the hell are y'all going to talk about? <laughs> Where are we going with this, right? And what does it have to do with yeah. getting paid? It has everything to do with um, not just getting paid, but really creating a work in life that you love. And I love the idea of, you know, a lot of times we have our plans and, um, and there's an old adage that says, you know, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, right? Uh, yeah. The, the <laughs> desert exactly. years are really about when the plans go awry, um, yeah. when things unexpected happen and, and, and then how do you regroup from that and how do you show up? But in, in, there's so much refinement that happens in that space that oftentimes if you're a woman who can identify with the desert years as we begin to define that, you'll know it instantly. Um, and you may be wondering like, what's gonna come out of this? And am I, did this, this, this just pushed me so far behind where I should have been or thought I was gonna be and all that kind of stuff. And you're gonna see that for all of us, the desert years, and they may not be years, Desert years is a metaphor. It could be yes or weeks, <laughs> you know, it could be yes or months. Or a day. Yeah, for me, I have some years. <laughs> I have some years too. But those desert years so make you the authentic woman that you are called to be. And for a lot of us, they actually prepare you for the mission in your work, whether it's a career, a business, you know, a movement, what have you. And it's it's the road that everybody has to travel. It looks different shows up differently, but it's all necessary. It's an integral part of you really creating, you know, the work that you were born to do. So let's get into it. Let's talk a little bit about um, your desert years. Libby, okay. tell, tell us briefly kind of your story, um, what happened and how that began to impact you in the world of work. Okay, well, why don't I start off with the uh, destruction of a very um, damaging stereotype, I think, for my community, right? Okay. So, you know, I think I've heard, you know, until my ears bled that most, you know, I don't know, most of North America thinks that Asian women are submissive and obedient and, you know, will do as asked, right? Because that's our culture. Well, it is a little bit about our culture, but when you go into a Chinese family, <laughs> more times than not, mama, okay, in a Chinese family is absolutely the one who is calling the shots and is how shall we say it? She's like the sun, you know, in our universe. We are just, even dad, okay, um, is orbiting around mom, okay? She is so central to who we are that um, I really almost just thought, like, I, I was literally her, you know, I tried very much to be kind of, who she was, right? Her mirror twin. I was her mini me, right? And um, I, I absolutely adored her. Uh, she's very different from me. Um, 
but I, I lost her to uh, breast cancer um, in 2006. So when I was, as, when I was about 29 and we had known that um, she, she had got, we had known about the cancer diagnosis for about two years before that. And we had, you know, hoped <laughs> beyond hope that, you know, she would beat it. Um, but, you know, and I learned a lot from that whole episode, but more uh, that number one, um, you, as much as you want to keep someone who, who's gotten sick in your life, you know, happy and alive and, and well, you know, sometimes life is, is sometimes, you know, God, whoever you're giving that higher power to, that's not in the plans, right? So I lost her um, when I was fairly young before I got married. And let's just say that is what basically kicked off a very hard time where I put myself into work. At that time, I just graduated with a master's of fine arts um, in writing from the California College of Arts. And uh, I'd just gotten um, a position at, shortly after she passed, I had just gotten a position um, as an associate at Ernst & Young in their um, corporate uh, pursuits and uh, business development group in San Francisco. So I threw myself into work and that, frankly, it, it was, you know, for me, it was a little bit of a godsend because I didn't deal with my grief at that time, right? I just, and for those who know about the big four, you literally are sometimes oh, just part off. And, and and just to give the audience like some, some context. So I came from, you know, I'm a very creative person, right? So I came off of this very creative graduate degree where I was with a lot of artists. And then my previous, you know, um, positions has been like an editor. I, I'm some, you know, comic book magazine. So my whole life had been, you know, people who, who were, you know, dress, you know, dress super with blue hair. Yeah, with blue, <laughs> blue hair. hair. <laughs> I still retain that love for that, you know, for that NorCal, you know, um, creative vibe. But I remember getting thrown into corporate America, you know, at the big four, right? And just not like absolutely just not knowing. Like I I didn't even have time sometimes literally to like E, sorry, EY, but that's basically the environment, right? And um, I guess my mom's death, um, you know, like just threw me literally out of orbit, right? It, it threw my dad out of orbit. It threw my brother, my little brother out of orbit. We, we lost our son, right? I mean, I don't, I really, for those who have lost family members, you know, uh, you know what I mean, but I mean, I'm just trying to make an analogy on how intensely painful and how out of whack that can be for someone, right? I was, de I was definitely working a lot. Um, and at the same time, um, I was trying to figure out what was the most important, what was the kind of like the most important thing, but I, I didn't even have that question. It was just trying to put one foot in front of survive. the other and to survive and to just be like, I have, I really don't have any direction right now because also in Chinese American families, okay, uh, especially if your parents are immigrants, they are the ones that tell you, oh, you need to put your one foot in front of the other. And then they try to plan out, you know, which direction. It's like, you know, you could go to them with your opinions, but really it's their opinion that matters the most, right? So I lost all of that. And, um, and you know, to answer, your, to answer your question, it was definitely losing the matriarch of our family. Yeah. So uh, if something that you said towards the end, um, I think is really profound. It's a, it's a really profound clue around desert years, right? And because obviously for Livia, the catalyst of her desert year was the, the, the devastating loss of her mom, right? Some of you listening, you've lost spouses or you've lost children, um, which is a whole different level of grief. 
but it's not always about grief. Sometimes it's about just such profound disappointment. Like for me, my desert years, you know, I left my corporate job. I went off kind of on this um, entrepreneurial journey and I'd always had, you know, different successes and all that. And, and when I, my first business failed, like literally I had a dollar 97 to my name, like I'd lost everything. And it wasn't so much the failure because in entrepreneurship, you're kind of expected to fail. It's almost like a little badge of honor. But there was so like the the journey was so long and so arduous because there was some refinement that needed to happen in my for me that I didn't know at the time as I was going through it. Like there were things that had to get shed. But you mentioned, Livia, that you know, you were talking about how your mom had, you know, your she would kind of tell you what to do. Like she would lay out which direction and which path. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of us in the desert years, we're at a place where we have to, we get to grow up and we get to mature and we have to start making decisions for ourselves. And every woman that's listening in, you're grown. Like you've made decisions. Mm -hmm. You've decided what college to go to. You've probably raised kids and all that. But for a lot of us, we know how to make decisions. But the question is whether or not those decisions are wholly 100% authentic to who we are, exactly. right? And so my whole definition of success before I went through my desert years was based on a conditioning that I didn't even know I had been influenced by. And so my identity was tied around it, how I, you know, whether I considered myself a success or failure was tied around that definition. And so it wasn't until I went through my own kind of faith journey and my own humbling that I really had an opportunity to start to think about, Vanessa, what do you really want? Like, yes, you could be an engineer, or you could be a doctor, you could be a lawyer, do you want to be any of that stuff? You know, yes, I want to, like, who do you want to be and what country should you really make? And so for, for Livia, that, the losing of her mom, and I'll, I'll actually, actually ask you a little bit more about it, but that started a snowball effect and a journey for you to really kind of tap into who am I? And what do I want? And is what I want really what I want? Or is what I want what someone else has conditioned me to want, which isn't always bad. It's not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just about the authenticity that comes and is required as you start to create perfect work. Let me ask you this, because I think what's really interesting is that a lot of times we don't know what people are dealing with, you know, behind the scenes. Yep. And, and Stephen Furtick has this uh, great quote um, and he says that oftentimes we're comparing our behind the scenes to other people's highlight reels, right? Correct. Whether that highlight reel is the social media highlight reel or whether the highlight reel is how I'm doing at the water cooler, or whether the highlight reel is, you know, what my girlfriends and I get together for a happy hour and we're talking about, you know, our marriages or this, like those are all highlight reels if, if there's not a sense of vulnerability there. And so again, we don't ever know what people are going through on any given day, right? So for you, going through that season, you know, you are 29, you're pushing 30, 30 is a milestone year. You got married a couple years after that, yep. you know, so that was a big milestone that your, your mom had missed. And now you're in your big girl job at e and you know, big girl job. Big job, right? Yes. How are you, how are you showing up on the outside to the world? And how are you actually coping on behind the scenes? Because I think that's important for people to, to hear and even be able to identify with themselves as well. You know, I did have direction from EY, right? On how I had to appear on the outside. So I, had, I did have to have a professional, um, I had to ha have a professional wardrobe, mm -hmm. right? Um, even, and even though at that time I was not client sir, I wasn't, external client serving, but mm -hmm. we, we had a dress code. And in fact, mm -hmm. I, as everybody has heard, I come from a very creative, like we were like the environments of work that I used to be in, people would wear skate shoes, mm -hmm. jeans, you know, like ripped up t-shirts. So I had to really adjust. And that in itself, like took a lot of effort. I remember getting feedback where I, I think, you know, some of my bosses were like, you know, it's a little too casual, Livia. 
you know, and I was like, darn, you know, like, and, and I would, I, I, and I did my best because I will, I will share with you where mom and dad come, come in. They did give me work ethic and they, they did give me like, you got to do what your bosses say, especially, you know, you know, coming from an immigrant family. So I did work hard to try to fit the look mm -hmm. of, you know, someone in a big four. Yep. And so I think, I just looked very diligent, right? Mm -hmm. I looked very diligent. I was heads down, you know, as everybody knows now is that I was, I was trying, I was using work to cope. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a few other things that I used to cope to, which I'll talk a little bit about, but on the outside, you know, I think people are just like, whoa, Olivia's, you know, kind of outspoken sometimes, but you know, she's a hard worker and you know, she looks, she looks like one of us. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm, I'm not spilling the beans on like, oh my gosh, my mom passed away. And I'm like literally deeply crying like all the time inside. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will say that, um, you know, I was at EY for six years. Okay. And I did, I dressed the part um, I made a lot of, I made a lot of good, like friends and colleagues at EY. And I think what bonded us was the fact that I was professional. EY did teach me to be very professional, you know, in all ways. Right. And so, you know, on that surface, you know, Hey, you know, here's a professional, you know, at the big four. Right. You know, but, you're hey. also, but you're also moving on with life too. You were getting married. Like there was, was getting married. There, was good, there were good things happening yes. in the world. And I think that's, and, and we'll talk about that too, but I think that's an important point for people to understand that when we're, we go through situations where we feel lost and out of sorts, especially for high achieving women, it doesn't mean that the world stops. No, it doesn't. For you. Like you're still very much functioning and you're still yeah. very much delivering, like to be in an environment like E and Y, it's demanding. So you've got to be on your game to deliver. And so she's delivering. She's still finding an opportunity time for love and opportunity. And yet there's a part of you that still feels broken. Yes. And, and so I what was going on behind the scenes such that people can get a glimpse for themselves? Because a lot of them are showing up and they're, you know, they're punching in, they're delivering, they're, you know, they're getting promoted, they're getting married, and yet there's still places where they're like, I don't know who I am. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I want. So help them get to get a peek sure. inside that, because those are two parallel worlds that you're living in at the same time. Sure. So all of that was going on on the outside, right? And um, of course, everybody's happy when, and I did get, I got married to my husband when I was 32. Um, uh, but I did something that was very, I attribute to my mom. She, you know, she was the type of person who held things in and then didn't really deal with them. And I, I do think that, that, and she had a lot of, actually a lot of stress before she passed. And I think that was one of the things that contributed to her getting ill. And mm -hmm. I, I was doing the same thing, right? I, I, I will say I was motherless and I was just hardworking. And, and I will even say like to my the fiance and my husband, I was like throwing on a lot of this, like, you know, pressure to like, be a spouse, but almost to also be like a parent, you know, because I, and it was just strange in all ways, but you know, he, he you know, <laughs> he stuck with me during that time. And so you're right. And we made, you know, we made that time to commit to each other, but um, listen, what is the lesson, right? My, my mom got cancer and I burned out from working at the big four. So I, Burned out did, took a little bit longer to happen. It took six years, okay? But what ended up happening was I just knew, I, I was steadily feeling like I was getting away from myself. And I'm actually glad that I went through working that hard in, you know, corporate America um, because I realized um, one thing, even though I work with a lot of corporations now, I don't ever want to go back. So that was a really great thing for me to find out. Although, albeit, it took me six years. So what happened after that was once I quit, uh, I was a contractor for a little bit. I just went, Vanessa, I don't know what happened, but I think taking that action of just 
realizing one day that I did not want to dress that way. And yeah, we'll hear um, why. <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know. I've seen I've seen some I, that is I, true. I, Actually, I have a friend right? who is a managing director for a management consulting firm and she started her first day as a managing director with purple hair. Yes. Purple I, hair. I, I was like, it. "What? Purple hair? Think, She's bad." <laughs> I think West Coast is a little bit more. No, she's in well, New York. Oh, she's in New York. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I was I was surprised, but I was like, go ahead with that. Go ahead. <laughs> well, so, I was, so you were saying you you quit and you decided um, to to yes. I would say that probably um, the first step I took towards knowing myself was was taking myself out of the corporate realm and realizing that that arena was not making me happy. And that, then I went like, can I say, then I went all out and I just, I just said, you know, I married a very creative person, you know, let's do an art gallery. Let's do, um, you know, let's support your textiles, you know, business. And it was, they were very small businesses, but they were super fun. And I, I even didn't really goal like for us to make money from it. Um, <laughs> At that time, I just wanted to go back to, you know, where I felt like my roots were a little bit with, and who I am core wise. I, I like, I, I'm going to interject at this point. So I, I want to bring it home for people that are, are listening. There's a couple of things I'm taking from what you're saying, right? And again, everyone's desert season can be for very different reasons, right? But there's some consistency around this feeling of being kind of lost or aimless or you know burnout can sometimes be um a symptom of that but really just losing the vision of where you're going in your life and it doesn't matter where you are on the the title spectrum on the achievement spectrum this happens when you're you know entry-level analyst someplace this happens when you're executive vice president of what have you like we can all get to those places and we can get to those places for different reasons. But I think a couple of things that came out of Livia's conversation is one, really being able to pull up and, it, and, and, and have an honest conversation around what do I want? And sometimes you don't know what you want, but you do know what you don't want. <laughs> um, and does, is this no longer what I want? And for high achieving women, sometimes it's hard for us to, to even acknowledge that this is what we don't want if we don't have a bridge to what's next. Mm -hmm. And so my encouragement is just being on, if this is not what you want, that's the starting place. It doesn't mean that you quit your job. Like there's some people, who quit, <laughs> some people you are not in a position where you can quit. You might be a single right. parent or you might have, you know, responsibilities for your parents. Like, so it's not always about quitting the job, but once you decide very definitively what you don't want and you make a quality decision around that then you can begin to open yourself up to possibilities around how can this change because it's not just about changing jobs sometimes it's about the environment like this is a toxic environment this is a toxic relationship this is so it's not always about i'm going to go leave job a and go start a business or go like it's not always about that radical Sometimes it's just about, this is not how I want to experience life every day. You've got, there's got to be something better than this. And it could mean a changing of departments, a changing of organizations, a changing of routine, whatever, right? So the first piece is really getting honest about something in my space is not working. The second piece of that is, I think, from what I'm taking from Livia, is it's okay to not be okay. And... It's okay to not know the answer. It's okay to not have it figured out. It's okay to admit that this sucks. And it doesn't matter how much time, energy, direction, investment I've made in this direction. It's not working. And, and that's okay. And for a lot of us, we will find all kinds of reasons to make what's not okay, okay. Sometimes we do it for spiritual reasons. Well, you know, you know, I'm supposed to be content and this and that. And so we'll use, gra oh, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm at my gratitude journal. I believe in all of that. And I also believe in, in calling crap that sucks, call it what it is, so that then you can figure out, you know, what's, what's, what's next. 
And so it's okay if it's not working for you. There's no shame in that. There's no, I got to beat myself up for that. There's no, I, I failed and this didn't work. Like the marriage is not right. Like it's okay to not be okay. And then the third piece of it from what I'm taking from Livia is finding the support system that gets you. Mm-hmm. Because here's the deal. Everybody that loves you doesn't always get you. Yeah. And I remember when I was going through my desert years, um, and mine was job related and I had left my corporate job and I had gone into entrepreneurship and the entrepreneurship went really, really well. It was doing great. And then it imploded. We got caught up in the recession and yeah. we had a terrible plan and it was a, a partnership from hell. It was like a bad divorce. Like it was just, it was just, it was not, it was ill formed. <laughs> it wasn't the recession because there's lots of businesses that survived that recession and they thrived and they did just well. I had a bad plan. But as I was going through it, I was trying to figure out my next and I've been struggling for a long time. And I remember having a conversation with my dad or I don't think I had a conversation with my dad. My mother told me something my dad had said in their conversation. And he was like, I just don't understand why she just doesn't go get a job and do blah, 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 oh, yeah. and yada, yeah. yada, 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 right? And my, I was tempted to be hurt because I felt like I failed my dad, right? But I under, but I had to understand that he didn't understand me. Yeah, like yeah. my dad was from a totally different generation and um, amazing. I love him to death and he loves me. And yet he's always worked. You know, he doesn't have that same level of vision or faith. Like he's not going to step out there and he's a lot more risk averse than I am. So for him, this idea of being in a place where you're struggling, like voluntarily, didn't yeah. make that made no sense at all. And I get it. Yeah. But that just meant that this is not the person that I could share my dreams with. Exactly. So yeah. The person that could cheer me on after the dream had been fulfilled. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. When, when you're showing not the person that I could connect to in the midst of the desert, in the midst of the valley, in the midst of the dark place, because he didn't get it. He didn't get and it. So he yeah. couldn't direct and guide he couldn't yeah. encourage he couldn't give me perspective not because he didn't yes. want to but because he couldn't yes. and so for some of you that are listening in and you might be in your desert place for whatever the reason happens to be you always must be careful with who you're sharing the desert space with exactly who you're inviting into the desert space you have to invite people in you cannot go it alone you go it alone you're going to be toast but when you do it You've got to be really, really careful about who you invite in because in the desert space, it's a very tenuous time and it's a very important yeah, time and it's going to dictate whether you thrive through it or whether you shrink back. Yeah. And so it's really important to find that support system, but it's also very important to be discerning on who that support system is. Every girlfriend is not the support system. Exactly. Your spouse is not the support system. Sometimes your spouse could be the biggest obstacle to you in the desert space, not because they don't love you, because they may not be equipped to support yeah. you. So I Can have I, a long monologue. No, it's you beautiful. Say, it's beautiful because you know, how you operate in that space when you're in that that space is really, really important. And so those are things that you've said in, in the narrative that I wanted to just pull out wow. so that people can can hang their hat on that. So I just really quickly, um, I wanted to add to that is that, um, it's, that's why I'm careful, right? I'm even careful now who I share, you know, who I share a lot of things with, not because I don't trust, but it's because I'm as high as a high achieving woman, woman, right? I have a lot of goals now. I mean, I even, I even did, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that I did during the desert years that, that are key to being a high achieving woman, even through those years, right? Making a list, you know, still exploring. But the thing that I wanted to push people to do during, you know, whether it is to number one is to pay attention, be present when you know that you're not happy and to be selfish in a way. Right. Um, and that my dad actually taught me that, um, when you're in a place where you don't know exactly what's being spelled out for you on the wall, right? Be selfish in that you're like, okay, I'm in a place where, and I'm, I'm literally telling you this is that 
that is maybe that is an opportunity for you to decide you know what what makes you happy and what doesn't right that is an opportunity where it's not written out you get to be the author you get to be someone who's like okay I know right now I'm not happy. What am I going to do to change that? So yeah, maybe it's not about quitting your job. Although I didn't quit my job, Ernest. I think I went to contractor and then, and then there was a little bit of- I was a talking about me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, oh, you ain't got to quit because I quit. <laughs> right? We had touched upon this in a previous conversation, but I will say, I will push this point for when you're at a point where you're just like, oh my gosh, I am feeling lost, right? Is- start to put things down on paper and think back to when you were a young child and say, are those dreams still alive? Right. And just start to explore, um, start to use some of that, those lost years to, to take some action, to take steps towards like, you know, if your parents were not supportive and many Asian parents are not Asian immigrant parents, love love you guys but there's just a very strong cultural aspect to do something that's practical right um if you want to be a script writer right i feel like after when i realized i was burning out i was not dealing with my grief i gave myself permission at that point to give myself space to number one deal with the grief at that point and and i will tell you the very real real is that what did my mom's death teach you? You don't have tomorrow. So why waste this today if you're not happy, right? So I finally realized I was like, you know, I'm young right now, but what am I going to be doing? So when I realized I was taking a step towards the great wide open, you know, I said, I want to do something that's related to artwork. I want to work with my friends. I want to, you know, do things like that support, you know, my home life, right? I did all of that right away. And, you know, at the time I will say, and I think a lot of women go through this, they worry about what other people think. I was definitely worried. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, what do they think about the name of this business? You know, like, what am I doing? But what was stronger more was like, I don't have tomorrow, right? I want to explore all of these things. And I have, I have a good support network that maybe doesn't get my vision, but is allowing me to do it or not even allowing, like just as like observing and making sure like, you know, I have a warm home to come to, come home, oh, right? Home. I'm not like <laughs> I'm not not orbitless, right? <laughs> But, but I am pushing women through this discussion to, mm -hmm. if you are not happy, explore, explore, explore. In fact, think of the desert as a beautiful place where you get to look at different fauna. You get to look at different fields. You get to look at different oases to understand what does make you happy. Because why, why go into a field and just be like, okay, you know what, I'm deciding I'm going to be like 20 years in, at this company because it's the right thing to do. And that's what my parents want me to do, or that's what's practical, right? I, I feel like when I, at the time when I looked at it and I was like exploratory, I was scared, you know, you know, I was just so scared about what other people thought, but then I would keep moving forward because you know, at that time I was like, I'm orbitless anyway, let's just figure something out. And, you know, no one's watching me. At least I didn't think anyone was watching me. And then when I explored, I did get to know myself. And, you know, when I look back, two things, when I look back at the desert years, I am proud of how I handled it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Number two, I was absolutely at the time I was like, Oh my gosh, you know, no one else is like doing um, art shows where we're going to, you know, like, you know, Mua in Oakland, mm -hmm. you know, um, that cute restaurant we were, they have their own art aesthetic. I just went in and I was like, you know what, we'd like to do an art show. You know, we want to put some paintings up and, at that time, I was like, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, mm -hmm. but now that I look back at it, I'm like, I'm so glad I did that. I have this experience and mm -hmm. I can actually say that I created a brand from scratch Maybe and maybe it didn't work out, but you know what? Just like you, Renessa, I'm going to point back to you. You went through that first business failure and now look at you, right? Mm -hmm. It taught you to 
like streamline and then make it even better for like the next adventure right and that's what i think the desert years are about is just i'm personally saying right now you know living breathing and happy where i'm at is um people recognize that i just went out on a limb i did stuff that made me happy and i learned I learned exactly what I liked and what I didn't like. I I learned I don't want to run a small business <laughs> at this juncture. It's not in my DNA, but I'm glad I did it because it gave me another perspective. Yeah. But it also taught me who I am, right? I want to be a, a part of a bigger movement. And um, I think people, you know, people saw that, that, and then they took the positive and now I'm, you know, a West executive director at Ascend at an organization that I'm, I'm completely passionate about. And, and I am going to be taking on even more responsibility with the national office later on this year. So let me ask you this, because I think this is important for people. As you went through, because obviously hindsight's 2020, so you can look back on yeah, it with so much more objectivity. But what do you believe that your desert season stripped you of? Like something that needed to go that if you had not had that experience, and obviously there's probably not, nothing that you would, you'd give anything to have your mom back. So that goes without saying. Yeah. I'm not saying, I'm not making that a good thing. Right. What I am saying is that sometimes as we go through those desert seasons, it strips us of something that actually needed to go that we needed to either release or shed or purge that allows us to blossom in this more authentic, um, fruitful way. If you had to pinpoint a thing, and there may have been multiple things, but if you had to pinpoint one thing, that man, had I not gone through that, had, had I not had that experience, this wouldn't have changed in me or this wouldn't have grown in me. What would be the thing that you feel like you had that got stripped, that got refined, that got burned away? in the desert for you? Okay, well, it's it's kind of a, a it's kind of a telescoping answer, um, but I realized life is not prescriptive, okay? Mm -hmm. I learned that that was totally stripped, okay? And that, and that what did I have to lean on? And for me, for me, that was faith, faith mm -hmm. in myself, faith in my higher power, right? And it's because I really, we call it the desert years because you're in the, you know, there's a reason for it, right? You are alone and, and sometimes you're totally naked and dying of thirst. And I mean, you know, there's not any sign. You don't know when you're coming out of it. So you are in survival mode. So for me, it was... I just literally was like, there's no manual for this. I have to decide whether or not I need to move forward or I stay and die. I mean, like die, you know, spiritually die, you know, go, you go back to a work environment that I did not love. And mm -hmm. also to a place where, you know, I just wasn't going to grow. Mm -hmm. And, and so I'm going to speak for high achieving women, right? Of course, we're not going to stay in a place. We're not going to grow. Okay. I mean, we could probably be naked and dying of thirst, but for us, you know, it's all about making sure that we are creating something that we're proud of. And that frankly, you know, Kumbaya, we're making our universes and the wider universe a better place. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so whatever that goal is, uh, what ended up happening through stripping of prescriptive prescription to what my life was going to be about like the story I realized I got to write the story and that I placed my faith in in God right at that time i um, I was praying a lot but I made a list okay and you know I was thirsty for direction but I realized the strength that I found in the desert years I was like oh my gosh you know what? That strength comes from me. It's not coming from a firm. It's not coming from my husband. It's not coming from my mom. It's not coming from anyone. Because when you're in the desert and you're by yourself, the only voice you're hearing is your own, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me to get organized with that, and you had asked earlier, what do I do, right? For me, I'm a writer. I, and I, and I do this with my mentees now. I say, okay, you make a list. And let me tell you, 
here is where I, I have to say it was beautiful. Okay. For, for a while, I mean, you know, we were making, we were trying to make ends meet. So um, I had actually an offer to join a startup and I was there for eight months after Ernst & Young. And it was actually a pretty high role. It was like a director, it was a director role, but I was just, I, I was like, you know, I took it because that was my practical side again. I wanted to be prescriptive, right? And I was like, oh, you know, I can't do it without a job, right? So, you know, I was like, what am I doing? And I lasted there such a short time. And then I was like, what do I do? Because I, like I lasted there such a short time. <laughs> I know, I lasted there such a short time. And then I was like, oh my God, I got a job. I did, I did lift. I was, you know, I'm not shy about saying like, I think at that time I was like, I didn't want my husband to, you know, we were building a business and Lyft was super new. And I had a friend who I walked, do like walked my dogs with like um, up here, uh, you know, where I live. And she's, and she, I respected her too, cause she graduated from Harvard and she's a lot like, have you heard of this company? And like, they're giving these bonuses. And I was like, what is this about? And I was just all like, okay. So, you know, we were doing the business and, it wasn't re there was no return so i was just like well i i did live for like a year right and in the interim you know making sure that like i could afford the you know we had a, we bought a house at that time so i wanted to make sure i contributed to the mortgage while we're building a business at the same time exploring having a lot of fun exploring but then what i ended up doing was i made a list and what I made a list of was I wanted um, my, what my next role was going to be, like how much I wanted to make. And then, um, and then that I wanted to work from home. <laughs> I put those in that order, Vanessa. And I don't think I told you the story, but what ended up happening was, um, and this was when, you know, we were struggling, like how you were talking about, I only had a dollar 97 to my name. Well, similar, right? I could not let that happen. I was like, we work so hard. I can't not, I can't let something where I was just like, Hey, I decided to be exploratory. I still was at, wanting to make sure like everything was okay. But like, I loved, I loved Lyft as well. We can talk about that later. Lyft made me into a master networker <laughs> and was actually the way that I met the recruiter that got me into Ascend, okay? And I remember praying about it, putting the list together. And that's why I tell my mentees, you got to make a list and you got to do it for your five year and your 10 year. Mm -hmm. But then what happened was I knew it was, I knew it was my faith and, and my, you know, where I was putting my honor for that. Um, and so basically, when I received the offer from Ascend, um, it was higher than the role that I had put on the list. It was for more than I had asked for um, in terms of salary. And I totally got to work from home. And it, they even said it was, and it was in the order. The offer, the verbal offer, Vanessa, was in the order of my list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's funny because, um, probably those, those years where I got to explore supporting my husband's um, business, going out and doing art stuff, you know, you know, and doing lift and just like figuring stuff out. I felt like, okay, well, I'm still wanting to go. I just made a very simple list. I put prayer towards it. I put all this good energy toward it. How can you explain that I got a verbal offer that literally in order gave me more than I expected, you know, at the end of the day when I was, coming out of the desert years. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, it can only, for me, it's, it, for me, it's God, it's my spirituality, and I'm so happy that I did it. But when I look back at the desert years, guess what? I'm so happy I did the art gallery business. I'm so happy I know more about textiles now. I'm so happy that I got to learn about building a business from A to Z, because you know what? I took all of those things that I liked you know, the business development part, the marketing part, all it, and I took it to like this, like, this role that I have right now, where I'm literally building it to the place where I'm using all of the, the experiences and the skills I gained in the last years. And I'm, mm. I'm happier than a clam right now. Can I just say that? <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> but here's what I love about what you said. Um, and I think we can land the plane with that. 
life is not prescriptive. No, it's not. Um, and the beauty about life and the beauty of perfect work is that you get to design a life, a work in life that you love. And most of us don't realize that we get to design it, um, but we do. We and do. We look, at the, we look at everyone that's outside of us and we look at so many people who are forced to do certain things in certain ways. And then you think, well, because everybody else has to do it and that's the way that it has to be for me. And the reality is that's not the case. And it doesn't mean that you have to go out and start a business um, in order to design a work in life you love. Um, you can design that within the, con the confines of another organization, but you have to actually be very, very clear about what you want. And sometimes you have to go through the desert years in order to become the woman that you need to be in order to be able to do it. Like for you to even, it's very possible that you wouldn't even have been open to the opportunity at Ascend had your life gone a different direction. Like the person, the, to, to have the vision and to really see how all these other things that you did in these other businesses, those skills that you could tie into and actually transfer into building what looks like a completely different entity, like Ascend and textile business or Ascend and, you know, these other things are totally different. Right, but the skill sets that you build, you've infused them into helping this organization to really grow and to thrive. Um, but but all that came from the desert years as well. I would invite folks to consider, um, as you're listening in, is that you may be going through your own desert years for whatever reason. Um, you may not know why. You may not know how you're going to get out. Um, but there, my 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 hope is that that there's some trust or just a faith and this, it can just be a little mustard seed doesn't have to be a lot but there's some faith and some trust that everything that's being refined in you right now nothing gets lost everything is recycled nothing ever gets lost the things that i experienced in my own desert years i could not do the work that i do right now and connect to the, the men and women that I connect to right now and help them create their perfect work right now. I can never do any of that work had I not had those experiences in the desert years. There were things that got refined and stripped and burned off. There's a greater sense of flexibility and surrender and openness to possibility that I have now that I did not have before and would never have ever, ever wanted to adopt <laughs> had I not been forced to go through it that then allows for magic to happen. I wouldn't even be doing this series had it not been for, for learning how to be open and flexible and creative and to release stuff and not be so controlled about how things turn out and what they do. Like there's all, I, I believe that I can make magic out of anything. And so there's a peace of mind and, and, and a joy and a, and a lightheartedness that comes in that space that, that did not happen prior to those desert years. And so, and there will be desert years again and again and, yes. again and again, and you learn how to navigate through them because there's gems in the refinement. Makes you it's stronger. It's not just always about the fire and the thirst and the hunger and all that, right? Metaphorically speaking. Yes. So that being said, my hope is that you have been encouraged in some way and really to start thinking about where you are and, um, and what you want coming out of it and to be able to get vision again and start grappling for some of those gems. But that being said, can you tell us just a little bit about, again, Ascend is an amazing organization. Um, and obviously it caters towards the Pan-Asian community, but that, that yeah. doesn't mean that if you're not in that community that you cannot get in there and benefit yeah. from the work that they're doing. Um, so yeah. tell us a little bit about the free gift that you're offering um, okay. to the audience and, and how, and I'll share with them how they can connect to it. We do um, promote, and we are inclusive, so you do not need to be uh, Asian to Asian American, Asian to join, but our mission and vision is to change the leadership landscape in corporate America, corporate Canada, um, because our research has found that it is not necessarily that we're having um, the Pan Asian community is not as much having a challenge as entering into the workforce or being in the pipeline. It's just that with as much education and as much, um, you know, hard work that our uh, demographic puts into um, these realms, we're finding that an inor uh, 
inordinate amount of these professionals are, are retiring at director level, which is actually not a good scene because we want these professionals to rise and reach their maximum potential, which is to reach into and hold positions in the C-suite and also at the public board levels, um, which we're finding that um, for Pan-Asian men and Pan-Asian women, they are some of the least representative faces and voices in those realms. So that is the mission and vision of Ascend. Um, you can find us at ascendleadership.org. And um, the free gift is actually on ascendconvention.org, which is um, happening late next month. And if you go on to ascendconvention.org, you'll find that there are segments of um, free signups. Or if you wanted to attend the entire convention, which now is about six weeks long, we've got activities starting from you know the beginning of August is that there are tickets for purchase or there are tickets where you can attend our impact challenge um, and even our career fair that might be helpful to those out there that are, that are thinking this organization might be good for them. So you'll have access, if you click down below this video, you'll have access to um, the links. And so again, some of those links, and they'll have all the details there, some of those links will give you access to the free, like the career fair and some of their other free content and all of that. And then obviously if you want to, to purchase and get greater access to different things, you'll be able to do that as well. Um, but with all that said, we are delighted to have you here, Olivia. Thank you for your vulnerability, your authenticity, um, and for having such an important conversation for women and giving us a space and a permission to, to be um, and to deal with what is and be able to grow through what is so that we can have so much more of what we truly, truly desire. And so with that, um, I will say on behalf of Olivia and myself, we wish you every success and happiness. Um, and we will see you the next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Rasa. And you know what? Absolutely. You know what? I totally am saying it's beautiful to be lost. So, you know, <laughs> it is beautiful to be lost. <laughs> so go for it and get lost. <laughs> Alrighty, we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Thanks,